Hello, I am Dr. Jamin Zhang. Under Module One, the first lesson you will learn is the basics of marketing research. Upon successful completion of this lecture, you'll be able to define marketing research, explain different types of marketing research, such as problem identification versus problem solving research, and basic versus applied research. Explain six steps of the marketing research process and articulate the nature and scope of marketing research and its role in marketing decision making. These are some of the most fundamental basic introductory concepts that will help you start building your knowledge in the world of marketing research. Let's dive in. Definition of marketing research. What is marketing research? According to Professor Malhotra, marketing research is the systematic and objective identification, collection, analysis, dissemination, and use of information for the purpose of improving decision making related to the identification and solution of problems and opportunities in marketing. This is a pretty comprehensive definition, but this is rather long. I don't expect you to memorize this. All you need to do is to be able to paraphrase it in your own words. If I were to ask to shorten this definition, I would say marketing research is to critically evaluate situation, gather data, generate insights to help managers make an informed decision. Okay, this is not as comprehensive yet as the long version, but it is simple and I can restate this anytime, anywhere without having to memorize it. So try to internalize it in your own unique way. If that's hard at this point since you didn't learn much about it, that's okay. Simply understand the definition and just move on. Classification of marketing research. In the next several slides, we'll try to classify marketing research. There are two types of marketing research. Problem identification research and problem solving research. Problem identification research is the research undertaken to help identify problems which are not necessarily apparent on the surface and yet exist or are likely to arise in the future. Examples include market potential, market share, image, market characteristics, sales analysis, forecasting, and trends research. This type of research is helpful in early stage of marketing research and often serve as reference point for another type of research, problem solving research. In contrast, problem solving research is the research undertaken to solve specific marketing problems. When we say marketing problems, we usually refer to fundamental marketing issues. They are target market and marketing mix, aka 4Ps. So problem solving research revolves around segmentation, product, pricing, promotion, and distribution. Let me elaborate more on these two types of research. Problem identification research is rarely done by clients. Rather, it is often conducted by syndicated secondary data providers who then make the research available to a multitude of clients in return for some fees. For example, Avis World conducts industry analysis for all kinds of industry. Their reports tell us overall industry outlook, major competitors, sales size, market share, competitive forces analysis, industry life cycle, expected future growth rate, etc. This information is valuable in understanding the background for later stage of research. On the other hand, problem solving research is what the most clients are interested in as it directly concerns the marketing problem they face. 
Thus, it is often conducted by clients and marketing research suppliers that work for the clients. Problem solving research is the research that is directly related to the marketing plan, target market, and four P's of marketing product, price, promotion, and distribution. Let's look at each of them one at a time. First, segmentation research. It determines the basis of segmentation. For example, by gathering the opinions of potential customers on product and their characteristics, you can find out profiles of various characteristics of customers who like the product. You can then see which basis would work best to segment the market. The base may turn out to be demographics, psychographic, lifestyles, or benefits that they are seeking. You will be able to profile the characteristics of the segments that are positive to your product idea. Second, once you know the characteristics of various segments of market, you can do further research using secondary data to identify the number of people in the U.S. that match the profile. This allows you to calculate the size of segments or market potential in terms of expected sales amount. Third, if you ask the right questions in the survey, you can pinpoint the segments that would best respond to your marketing. Combining all those aforementioned information, you can determine the segment that you should pursue, that is target market. Similarly, you can do product research. First, test concept. After marketing managers narrow down product concepts to determine the one to pursue, they can evaluate those concepts by inviting potential customers to a research analyze their responses, and then choose the best concept to go after. Second, marketers can also determine the best product design or the package by seeking opinions of potential customers. Third, marketers can determine whether or not product modification should be done and how it should be modified. Fourth, Brand positioning research will allow marketers to map consumers' sentiments about competitors' products and help marketers decide the best position the new product should take in the minds of consumers. Finally, test marketing is often used. Before launching a new product at a national scale, marketers can select some cities as test market, then assess market responses prior to the national debut. This can allow them to reduce risks involved in the new product development. By now, I think you should have enough idea as to how marketing research can be helpful in solving marketing issues. So I won't go into too much detail in other areas of marketing. Let me briefly talk about how marketers can help other areas of marketing mix by using research. Pricing research can be about appropriate pricing policies and understanding the role of pricing in influencing consumer purchase. It can also be about determining appropriate level of product line pricing and price elasticity of demand for a product just name a few. The list can be endless. Promotion research. Through research, marketers can also determine the optimal level of promotional budget to maximize profit. Optimal promotional mix among advertising, sales promotion, PR, personal selling, and direct marketing. Again, these are just some of the possibilities, and the list can go on and on. The last in the list of problem-solving research is distribution research. Marketing research can be conducted to determine the channel issues, such as the type 
types of distribution, attitudes of channel members about our brands, the intensity of the wholesale and resale coverage, channel margins, retailers and wholesalers are expected to get best location of retail and wholesale outlets. In the previous couple of slides, we talked about the two types of marketing research, problem identification research and problem solving research. You should be able to explain how they are different and give some examples of each type of research. Next, we'll talk about another way of classifying research. All marketing research can be broadly classified into a basic research or an applied research, be it a problem identification research or a problem solving research. You might have already heard of these terms somewhere as this classification is not unique to marketing research. In any discipline, there is basic and applied research. Let's take a close look at these terms one at a time. Basic research is intended to find out general principles governing the relationships between variables. The goal of research is to discover new knowledge that can be generalized across people, place, and time as much as possible. Here are some characteristics of basic research. First, basic research attempts to expand the limits of knowledge. For instance, ever since Richard Perry and his colleagues have proposed ELM, Elaboration Likelihood Model, in 1980s, there have been thousands of research conducted trying to clarify and refine the model. None of those studies were the same. You cannot use the same questionnaire again. Each study is different and unique so that the findings are unique and add value to the existing body of knowledge. To push the envelope, so-called academic journals maintain editorial review board and have multiple reviewers critically evaluate the merit of an article submitted for publication by using double-blind system in which reviewers and authors do not know who the other parties are. This system ensures objective assessment of the quality of the research. Once accepted, the article is published and everyone around the world can read it to learn what new findings were made. The next person cannot test the same thing as their research would be considered lacking contribution. Most good journals consider contribution, rigor, and interest as selection criteria. Thus, there is a lot of competition around the world in basic research regardless of disciplines. There is a lot of check and balance in place. One or two scholars, no matter how brilliant they are, cannot change the true nature of an inquiry. Any lies or falsification of data will eventually be discovered if the findings do not make sense from the theoretical perspective. Researchers around the world, normally professors, test theory from the thousands of different angles until the point there is no new idea to refine the theory. This way, we expand the limits of knowledge in basic research. So, in basic research, researchers tend to do so-called literature review to understand the current state of research on the topic and often draw on theory. Based on the literature review and theory, researchers propose hypotheses and test them by collecting data. Second, basic research generally try to provide a general knowledge that has not been discovered before. If you find something other researchers already found previously, the value of your research will be minimal and you will have a hard time in getting your research published in academic journals. Third, basic research is not directly involved in the solution to a pragmatic problem. Unlike applied research, basic research is not interested in finding solutions for only a certain organization or 
a certain situation. Because such a constraint would prevent generalization of the findings outside the organization or the situation. Fourth, results from the basic research tend to be conclusive rather than exploratory because there is a heavy emphasis on theory, which is the coherent body of knowledge. When we base our research on the literature, usually we can find sufficient evidence to support whatever idea you have. So you can formulate a hypothesis, and your goal is to test that hypothesis. So basic research tends to be theory-driven and conclusive, as opposed to ad hoc and exploratory. Let's suppose you find an interesting thing from your research, but you didn't anticipate it since the theory didn't allow you to expect such a finding. I mean, you did your due diligence in doing literature review, but there are not much to support the unexpected finding. This situation often arises in research. It did occur to me too. A surprising finding is interesting, so this is not a bad news. What should you do then? Go back to the literature review and do a keyword search thoroughly and see if the paradoxical finding can be explained. If you are able to find a reasonable explanation that is supported by some research, this is a great news. You may be able to present one of the first evidence to refine the theory. If you are able to publish it, some other researchers will pick it up from there and to see if your findings are tenable from a different angle. The theory would not be refined unless there is enough research reinforcing your argument. By this time, I hope that you understand the importance of literature review and theory-based research and see some of you pursue basic research as your future project. It is a lot of fun reading articles if you are interested in the topic. Once the research is done, you will become an expert in the topic. Let me give you an example of one of my own research to illustrate a basic research. I conducted this research with three of my co-authors, second author being my former student. Our research was published in the Journal of Business Research in 2014 page 1303 to 1319. In the sixth issue of the volume 67 with the title, Does Telic Paratelic User Mode Matter on the Effectiveness of Interactive Internet Advertising? A Reversal Theory Perspective. Let me briefly introduce this research in the next couple of slides. Reversal Theory. According to Apter, Reversal theory is a theory of motivation, emotion, and personality, and it concerns how individuals interpret experiences rather than the specific content. One of the meta-motivational states people have is telic versus paratelic, whereas telic state is goal-oriented, serious-minded, and arousal-avoidant. The paratelic state is spontaneous, playful, and arousal-seeking. Individuals swing between these two modes. Let me explain the theory a little more. If you are in telic mode, which is a serious-minded mode, and encounter a high level of arousal, you'll be anxious and feel unpleasant as a result. As the level of arousal drops, you'll be more and more relaxed and feel more pleasant as a result. In contrast, if you are in a paratelic mode, which is a playful mode, and encounter low level of arousal, you'll be bored and feel unpleasant. As the level of arousal increases, you'll be more and more excited and feel more pleasant as a result. Therefore, the same high arousal level can be interpreted as an anxiety or excitement, depending on the person's bistable state or mode interpreting the 
motivational experience. If you are in telic mode, which is a serious-minded mode, we learned that high arousal makes you feel unpleasant, whereas low arousal makes you feel pleasant. An interactive ad will arouse you more than a non-interactive ad. Therefore, you'll be more pleasant when you watch a static banner than an animating banner. So we made it as hypothesis 1A. If you are a telic mode, if you are in a paratelic mode, which is a playful mode, we learn that high arousal makes you feel pleasant, whereas a low arousal makes you feel unpleasant. An interactive ad arouses you more than a non-interactive ad. Therefore, you'll be more pleasant when you watch an animating banner than a static banner. So, we made it as a hypothesis 1B. To test this hypothesis, we did a field experiment involving 141 Facebook and Twitter users. The result shown in the chart supports our hypothesis. Further, this research shows that it was the arousal-seeking tendency that explains why the meta-motivational state, telic versus paratelic mode, influenced participants' attitudes toward the ads the way they did. As you can see in the study, our hypotheses are general, pertaining to the interactive versus non-interactive ads. To test the hypothesis, we used only one kind of ads, static banner and animating banner, as a sample. As a basic research, there was no studies like ours. This research contributes to the theory, as this study was one of the first empirical marketing studies to utilize reversal theory. This research contributes to the online advertising research by incorporating the meta-motivational state when online users come in contact with the interactive ad. I hope that you can see some characteristics of basic research from this example. If you want to know more about this research, I invite you to read my paper. Applied research. Unlike the basic research, applied research is intended to generate knowledge that is specific for a certain situation for a certain organization. Thus, it has limited applicability outside the organization or situation, limiting the value of research. Yet, this type of research provides the most valuable information for the firm, helping them take actions with confidence. Let's look at some examples in the next slide. Examples. The first example is, should McDonald's add Italian pasta dinners to its menu? Not many people outside McDonald's would find it relevant, and the findings would not be generalizable beyond the research setting because McDonald's target market who participated in the research is not likely to be representative of the population. The second example is, should Procter & Gamble add a high-priced home teeth bleaching kit to its product line? Who cares about this finding if you are not working for P&G? How can the research findings be used by other companies? Not much. Okay, now that you know enough about basic and applied research, let me test your understanding. Here is a quiz. Which of the following statements is correct? A. Basic research is always easier than applied research. I might be biased, but I feel this is actually the other way around. One of the goals of the basic research is to make contributions by proving hypotheses. This entails not only a thorough understanding of the literature, but also the use of scientifically rigorous methods. Further. Anonymous reviewers will evaluate the merit of the research through so-called double-blind review process in which both reviewers and researchers do not know the identity of the other parties. On the other hand, most of the time, 
Applied research uses very simple analysis tools such as descriptive statistics and cross tabulation because clients would not understand sophisticated statistics. Of course, there are times when very sophisticated methods are called for, but by and large, most of the time, what you learned in this course is just sufficient. Further, there is no third parties that evaluate the scientific rigor involved in the research. In addition, data collection is easier with applied research as market research practitioners outsource the data collection in client research, whereas researchers conducting basic research have to compete to get grant for business research, and oftentimes grant for business research is rarely available. In short, A is wrong. B, basic research is less scientific than applied research. Well, this is wrong. Reliability and validity of the research is an important issue when reviewers judge the quality of the research. Thus, sophisticated, rigorous, and state-of-the-art scientific method must be used in basic research. C. Basic research has greater applicability than applied research. This is correct. D. Applied research tends to be generalized better than basic research. This statement is wrong. It is the other way around. Okay, give yourself a round of applause if you got it correct. Research process. In this slide, we'll examine the six steps of conducting marketing research from start to finish. The first step is to define the problem. Managers may express a concern and define the problem from the managerial perspective which is not always helpful in doing marketing research. For instance, they may tell you sales dropped. However, this could be a symptom for a much deeper problem that gives rise to the symptom. The reason for the sales to drop might be that consumer preferences have changed. This could be the real problem. As a researcher, you then need to gather information about the changing consumer preferences and examine the relationship between the changing consumer preferences, their perception of the company's products, and their purchase level. All aspects of the information about the consumer preferences will be what you need to find out from the research. So, you can define the problem as perhaps to understand how consumer preferences might have changed and its impact on their attitudes toward the current product offering. The second step is to develop an approach to the problem. In this step, we are trying to identify what information we should gather to address the problem defined to identify informational needs for marketing research. Oftentimes, we refer to analytical framework and models that is known to be effective and theory-driven. In other words, we do a background research for the topic of interest by examining the existing body of knowledge accumulated through previous research. This is often called literature review in the basic research. You may also call it a secondary data research. Yes, you would look at secondary sources of data conducted by someone else. Knowing enough about a theory or existing body of knowledge helps us to pose research questions or even formulate a rather specific responses to the research question, which we call hypotheses. Hypotheses are a statement of the expected relationship among the concepts in the hypothesis. For example, you may hypothesize that changing consumer preference will have a negative impact on the attitude toward the product. Thus, having a hypothesis allows researchers to articulate the concepts that must be captured when we ask questions in a questionnaire. Thus, both research questions and hypotheses are necessary for us to determine the kinds of information we need in order to address the problem. One question often asked is, what is the difference between research question and hypothesis? Well, there is not much difference between the two, except that we use the term 
hypotheses. If we have a specific direction regarding the relationship between the concepts, in this case, we would state the relationship clearly as follows. Changing consumer preference will have a negative impact on attitude towards the product. When we do not have specific expectations due to the lack of sufficient rationale to support it, we call it a research question and would state it in a form of question, as in, how will changing consumer behavior influence their attitudes toward the product. Do you see the difference? In sum, developing an approach to the problem involves doing a literature review or background research and formulating research questions or hypotheses. You might ask, what do I do when there is no theoretical model or analytical framework, perhaps because I am dealing with a brand new phenomenon? My answer would be to dig up the literature thoroughly. There is normally something in Eastern research that can help you understand the new phenomena. For instance, social media marketing is surely a new phenomenon, but there are plenty of research done in offline mode that could shed light on the consumer behavior in the context of the new medium. I tend to believe a saying, there is nothing new under the sun. Having said this, however, there can be a legitimate reason why marketers are reluctant to rely totally on the literature review. First, most marketing research pr practitioners may not have access to the expensive database to do the literature review, so they may rely on World Wide Web to gather whatever information they could get their hands on. More importantly, there are also cases when you just cannot gain enough insights about the issue from the literature review because the knowledge generated through the basic research is so general and broad that there is often no specific information tailored for the specific products for the specific target consumer groups. In this case, marketing research professionals tend to prefer conducting some sort of qualitative research to gain insights into the problem. This includes soliciting opinions of industry experts and conducting focus group research or interviews to hear directly from consumers. All of these are called exploratory research because you are exploring the issue rather than testing hypotheses, preconceived ex expectations. This type of exploratory research helps researchers gather enough information to articulate research questions or hypotheses and ask right questions in a questionnaire that will be used in a conclusive research, which is the next step. The third step is to formulate conclusive research. You will need to determine which type of research to use. You may use a survey, an observation, or an experiment. A right method will be determined in part by research questions and hypotheses, among other things. Next, you work on measurement and scale, which is about operationalizing the concepts embedded in the research questions and hypotheses. For instance, one of the concepts in the hypothesis given previously is attitude towards the brand. Let's say you decided to operationalize a construct by asking the participants to indicate the extent to which the product is positive, negative, desirable, undesirable, useful, useless, high quality, low quality on a 1 to 7 point scale. A set of these four questions are a measure of the construct called attitude toward the product. Once measurement and scale is determined, you can easily design a questionnaire by simply including those question items for each of the constructs in the questionnaire and arranging them in a proper order. Thus, measurement is about deciding what to ask in order to capture the true meaning of the concept or construct. Once questionnaire is ready, you will select a right sampling method and sample size. The first step is to do field work and collect the data. This is one of the challenging process. The harder it is to reach the target audience, the more expensive it is to collect data. 
The fifth step is to prepare the data for analysis and analyze the data. Researchers normally use a statistical package such as SPSS, Excel, R, or SAS. SPSS is the most popular tool in survey research, but R has been catching up rapidly since it is a open source and free. R is great, very powerful. You can draw awesome charts that no other software can match. It is also great for data mining and text mining. The sixth and the last step is to prepare a report and make a presentation. According to a recent survey I conducted, market research professionals consider presentation as the most important fundamental knowledge to learn. I will teach you later how to design presentation slides and make a great presentation. Most market researchers do not get to perform every step of the research process because division of labor works in market research industry too. There are a lot of teamwork involved. If you are running a company as a sole principal like me, you will have to do the majority of the work by yourself. Even then, some of the works may be outsourced. For instance, Many researchers tend not to collect data by themselves. Rather, they tend to outsource it to data collection specialty companies like SSI, STS, and ResearchNow. Having said this, however, everyone needs to know about the six-step research process to understand the role of their work in the broad scheme of marketing research process. Okay, we are done on this slide. I probably talked too much on this, but I couldn't help because these slides sum up the whole thing you will learn about marketing research from start to finish. I hope you observed it as much as you can now and revisit this slide later for review. Okay. So far, we learned what the definition of marketing research is, types of marketing research, and the six steps of marketing research process. Now let's talk about the role of marketing research in making marketing decision. The role of marketing research. So there are two reasons why companies should conduct marketing research if they want to be successful in marketing. The first and foremost important reason for doing marketing research is to avoid risks in decision making. Without sound information, the odds of making a wrong decision based on the poor information is high. Unsound information leads to poor decisions, which in turn leads to a waste of large sums of money or lost opportunities. Unfortunately, Many business executives rely on their gut feeling in making an important decision. Whereas large companies tend to have their own marketing research personnel and utilize marketing research, small to medium-sized companies do not have a dedicated marketing research department. And intelligence gathered about consumers and markets tend to be less methodical and more anecdotal. Too often, top management in those small firms simply use their own experience and gut feelings to make an important decision. They feel that they cannot afford to have a group of marketing research professionals in-house or they feel that it is a waste of money. As the society becomes more and more complicated and the pace of change quickens, it is imperative to be scientific in dealing with information. One of the change environment in the U.S. is the racial makeup. By 2025, minority groups are expected to outnumber whites. Thus, ignoring minority groups, companies cannot hope to become a market leader. I am on the executive board for the Marketing Research Association's Southern California chapter. As the board member, I have had the privilege to get involved in planning multicultural conference every year. As years pass by, I see more and more people are attending the conference. Proactive companies are thinking ahead and plan ahead. Uncertainty in the future makes things more complicated. 
Companies hesitate to make a move as they find it hard to make an informed and sound decision. This is why the Bureau of Labor Statistics projects job growth rate in marketing research to be threefold more than that of all the occupations together, year after year. It is becoming increasingly unlikely that managers can justify not doing a research prior to making an important decision. Secondly, marketing research is important in identifying opportunities. For instance, advancement in social media and digital marketing ushered in an unprecedented level of data, and most marketing managers don't know what to do with it. Demand for the data mining skills, social media listening, and digital analytics soared in recent years. Marketing research professionals who know how to use a software called R is commanding 30 grand more than those who don't, according to a recent Wall Street Journal report. Most university marketing programs across the country are scrambling to find a way to educate the next generation of marketing managers, the skills the changing business world demands. I'll talk about the emerging trends and opportunities for you whenever relevant throughout the course. Therefore, it is not surprising to meet market research professionals working in a company to feel very proud. They say top management respects them and often communicate with them to get their advice. As a source of information, the market research professionals seem to be quite happy with the role they play in their companies. The decision to conduct marketing research. Should we always conduct research? The answer is no. There are many factors to consider in making go-no-go decision. Let's look at the flow chart in the slide. First, does the management have a positive attitude toward research? If the answer is no, you don't conduct research. If the answer is yes, you move to the next question, which is, are enough resources available to collect additional information and implement the findings? If the answer is no, you don't do research even if your boss is favorable towards the research. If the answer is yes, you may move to the third question, which is, is additional information needed to make the decision? This is a good question because through a short exploratory research such as secondary data research using database, you might find all the answers to address the problem. Thus, you may not need additional information. If so, you should not conduct a primary research as you cannot justify the cost. However, if you still need to find more information not available in the secondary data research, then you can ask fourth question, which is, is the decision of strategic or tactical importance? If the answer is no, you don't want to spend money to find information for an important decision. But if the decision is an important one, you can move to the next question. Does the value of additional information exceed the cost of research? You want to weigh the benefit and cost of doing research. If the cost outweigh the benefit, it will be difficult to justify doing research. If the benefit outweigh the cost, then you'd want to proceed with the research. So, let's look at some of the elements of cost and benefit in more detail. First, benefit or value. Marketers should ask themselves the following. Would the information gained from research decrease the uncertainty inherent in decision making? Would the research increase the likelihood of making a correct decision? Would it improve business performance and enhance profits? The more positive you are about the value of research, the more you can feel good about conducting research. Next, you need to consider cost. How much do you need to spend for research? Would the company have to delay business decision 
until research is completed? This is a problem. Timing is everything in business. In a rapidly changing environment, top management want the result of research fast. Would conducting research potentially make the company disclose important company secrets to the rivals? What if there is an error in the research result that could lead the firms to make a wrong decision? All these factors cost the company. Once you considered all the values and costs carefully and determined that the value of the research overall exceed the cost of conducting research, then you may proceed with the research.